Welcome to the Global UT International Honor Society Leadership Workshop. My name is Lisa Dupile, and I'm a third year LLB student. I'm super excited to have you here today, and I will be with you for the next hour. And please do so by uh, using our chat box by looking in your name, your questions, and your location. Joining us today is a remarkable and exceptional woman who will be sharing her abundance of knowledge on communication and team building by highlighting the facts of what a team means and how communication incorporates with it. Let me tell you a bit about what makes her so remarkable. She is the Chief Network Officer at the African Leadership Academy. She leads the division, the network division, shaping and strengthening programs alongside her committed colleagues. She's head of football career working in management and operational consulting, engaging corporate clients in various initiatives involving stakeholder relations, business process improvement, organizational design, governance, and societal impact. Being bilingual, that is in French and English, has afforded her the opportunity to work in various parts of Anglophone and Francophone Africa on projects in the mining, manufacturing, and oil and gas industries. She has had extensive exposure to the public and regulatory sector through her work with the government agencies and state-owned entities. As she's in leader she is, she has experience in mobilizing and managing resources in a multicultural setting in the development of new strategies and program implementation. Joining the African Leadership Academy has been one of the highlights of her professional journey. For the longest time, she has aspired to be a part of an organization whose vision would be to present a positive narrative about African continent by driving initiatives that grow and support the continent's vast potential and seek to make a meaningful difference in the decades ahead. She believes that the African Leadership Academy's network program is well placed to support such an ambition, with the right opportunities for impact in the field, such as education, um, Health, agriculture, and infrastructure development. She graduated from the University of Cape Town with a master's degree in science in chemical pathology in 2003 and completed an MBA at the Copenhagen Business School in 2011. She has expertise in program management, transition and change management, stakeholder management. So far, I'm so inclined to say that she believes in being cultivated and that. Only the sky is the limit as her achievements precede her. She is a proud receiver of the Danida Emerging Leader Scholarship from Copenhagen, Denmark from 2010 to 2011, the Whitehead Scientific Prize for the best master's, master's degree in science presentation from Cape Town, South Africa, a master's in business administration from Copenhagen Business School in 2011, a postgraduate diploma in business administration from the University of Pretoria, a master's in chemical physiology from the University of Cape Town in 2003, a bachelor's of science in human genetics from the University of Cape Town in 2000, and a bachelor's of science in biochemistry and mathematics from the University of Cape Town in 1999. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Maya Machikiza. Maya, it is such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you, Ms. Maya. Thanks, Lisedi. Well, quite a mouthful. I think I should practice um, shortening this bio of mine. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. Uh, leadership is always a topic, uh, particularly for uh, students such as yourselves who aspire to be leaders either in your future organizations or just in your communities. And so I take it as really such a pleasure to be able to share some of my experience with you. Um, I'll be using some models that I've come across um, in the course of my career. Uh, some will be useful. I, I hope that most of them will be useful. And I will leave some references um, at the end of uh, this conference so that you can refer back to articles or to these models when you want to uh, you know, get a little bit deeper into them. And so I understand that we're going to be talking about team building and communication primarily. Um, there's a bit of a journey to it though, because I believe that when we think about teams, we really also need to be thinking about us who are leading the teams. Uh, 
because ultimately how we communicate, how we organize our teams, how we set the direction or set the vision for a team really starts with what we believe, what our character reflects, um, and you are essentially how we communicate to people or with people. And so I want to start with that, uh, setting the leadership context, and then we'll go a bit later on into a bit about team building and a bit about communications. Of course, I have to put a big caveat up front. One hour or 45 minutes now is never enough to talk sufficiently about these very deep topics. I really encourage you, if you are interested in these, uh, topics, I really encourage you to do a little bit of reading later on and see how that prepares you either in the roles that you have uh, currently or the roles that you aspire to in the future. So let's jump in. So I wanted to touch on very simply, and I hope that you will be able to reflect um, yourself onto this slide about the type of leader that you are or the type of leadership context that you're in. So you could be a willing or a reluctant leader. Some of you have been pushed into positions that you were not necessarily prepared for. Um, and some of you were aspiring to these positions. And so you're quite a willing leader where you find yourself. This in itself, the difference between being a willing or a reluctant leader plays out in the way that you communicate and in the way that you even build your team. So that's one thing for you to be aware of. Are you a willing or are you a reluctant leader? Um, another one is, are you an introverted or an extroverted leader? Do you feel that you are there moments where you disqualify yourself, for example, because you say to yourself, well, I'm introverted. I think that I will manage my communication in this way or, you know, extroverts are generally better at communicating to a team. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it actually doesn't matter what our personal character or personalities are. Uh, when we are giving a certain uh, responsibility, the minute we step into the role, uh, team building communication and everything else that comes into leadership um, matters. And at that point, it doesn't matter what our personality traits are. Are you a visible or are you a hidden leader? Are you somebody who, for example, sits in student leadership and are therefore very visible to campus? Or are you hidden? Are you more in the background, still leading a group or still leading initiatives, but maybe not that, you know, um, maybe not all that visible? And there could be many other contexts that I could highlight here. Regardless of the position that you find yourself in, it's still very possible for you to be taking concepts around team building and around communication and apply them to your individual contexts. So again, if, whether you are <clears throat> part of student leadership, whether you're thinking about your family responsibilities, sorry, <clears throat> your family responsibilities or your work um, within the sports context or whether you're a mentor to a single individual, um, or whether you're even a lone ranger, you prefer not to have anything to do with people, you want to be a specialist in your field, but guess what, even there, there is some communication that is needed for you to apply in order to bring some level of in influence uh, to the world around you. And so wherever you come from, whatever your context is, I'm hoping that what we're going to talk about today um, is going to, I suppose, sow some seed for something that you will be using in the future. Here's what Warren Bennis said. He said that the most dangerous leadership myth is that leaders are born and that there is a genetic factor to leadership. That's nonsense, he says. In fact, the opposite is true. Leaders are made rather than born. Um, I know personally that it's, it's, it's the type of statement that I used to battle with because I believed that leadership, leaders were, were born, right? And that you could look around you and decide, yeah, that's a leader, that's not a leader. The reality is that the minute you have a responsibility, the minute you've got people that you're dealing with, and it's not about what job title you've got, the minute you work in a team, there's a level of leadership that you have to apply. And it's your responsibility to learn how to be a better leader. So you may have seen this before. This is model number one that I wanna share with you. Um, an overview of what the classical leadership framework is. And so the world out there <clears throat> classifies leadership in four dimensions. Number one, it will be that you're leading others, that you know your organization and therefore you lead your organization. You lead self, you manage yourself and you deliver on performance. And so when you're, when you're, when you're going through this entire conference, think about what part of this framework 
the conversations that you're in? What part of this framework is being fed? Is it working on your self-leadership? Is it working on you leading other people? Or is it about you knowing the organization or the community or the initiative or the project that you're working in? Or is it about delivering performance? And the conversations are very different, right? Because for example, in the case of uh, delivering on performance, it's very much about how do you deliver on results? How do you work on being a problem solver? How do you, you know, set, set an entire Gantt chart for your, for your project and reach milestones? Um, whereas when we're talking about self, we're talking about who are you as an individual? What are your strengths? What are the areas that you know you need to be working on? And it matters for you to constantly have this in mind so that you do not end up spending more time as a leader developing one part of yourself than another. And I know we're going to be talking about this part, leading others. But I want you to just keep in mind that there's a lot more about leadership than just leading others. Um, and to add to this, I want to maybe spend a bit of time talking about self first. And you might have heard me say a little bit earlier that I think as we're leading teams, we really reflect ourselves onto the way that we're leading the team. And so we need to understand our own triggers. We need to understand our own strengths so that we get better at building teams and at communicating with our teams. And if you want to look at yourselves as being on a journey of leadership, leading self is really where you start. Um, yes, you could be leading others already and could be leading teams that God knows even organizations, but leading self is really at the core. And I'll explain to you later why I feel this is very a very important starting point. But if you think about self-leadership, there are really four areas that you want to be thinking about. You want to be thinking about, and I've said that many times already, and I know I'm repeating myself a little bit, but knowing who you are, what do you believe in? Uh, what's important to you? Because what is important for you will translate. If you believe that working from 8 a.m. to to 11 p.m. is a value, that is what you would draw, translate to your team. Um, and you will quite likely want people who match those values of yours. What are your goals, right? Um, if you believe in a better balance in life, these things are going to translate in the way that you build your team. So it's important to first know who you are, right? So that you can remain and, and continue to be an authentic leader in the way that you build your teams. The next thing that you want to be aware of as a, as a leader about yourself is your behaviors. What triggers you? What tends to set you off? What tends to, to, to discourage you? It will not be the same for everybody, but be aware of that because you're constantly de dealing with people who have their own behaviors, who one way or the other will also trigger you. And you want to almost ahead of time know how you're likely to respond to a situation so that you can already decide wisely, um, more likely than not my nature will respond in this way, but this is how I should be responding. I should be responding differently, more diplomatically, so that it's for the benefit of the team and not for the benefit of myself. So know who you are, know what you do, know what motivates you, know your behaviors. And also, as you do that, have some level of humility because the third pillar is about knowing what you need to learn. Um, what have you identified as your areas of weaknesses? What feedback have you received from the team? Because um, here's the thing about leadership. You want to be open-minded about getting feedback about improving yourself as an individual who guides and who leads a team. And so what, what areas of learning have you identified and what are you going to do to improve in those areas? And this is constant. This is not just something you do at the start of your leadership journey. This is something that you do on an ongoing basis and you need to remain open to the fact that your leadership style, your leadership self will continue to evolve as you lead more and more teams along the way. And then learn how to use what you have learned um, so that you're able to build successful habits that, as I said just now, make you a most, more effective leader. So why am I insisting on this self-leadership thing? Well, my view is that your beliefs, your values, and your style, they shape your decision. And aren't decisions a way for you to lead your team? Aren't decisions what gives an answer? to a problem or that gives finality to a problem that you have been dealing with with a team. And so these decisions are so crucial that you wanna make sure that your belief, your values, maybe they will have enhanced these decisions, but in some cases they may also have tainted the decisions. So be aware of that or what they are so that you're able to make good decisions along the way. 
In addition, and I'll say this, this is a true story. However, however you've, whatever you've built around yourself in terms of capability and, you know, uh, a great way of speaking, a great way of building teams, you, 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 you do leadership by the book. Um, your true self always shows up. Your team, even though uh, um, it doesn't, you think it doesn't slip out, your team always is able to see past your shell. They will always know. They may not articulate it, but they will know if you're authentic or not. They will know if you're genuine or not, if you're honest or not. They will know. They will be able, more likely, more often than not, to tell what your motives are. Um, and so you want to have dealt with those things or you want to have worked on them in a manner that is good for the team, right? So self-leadership is crucial. And you reproduce after your own kind. If you are a little bit like most of us who you want to mentor and you want to coach people, you will likely pass on um, values and you will pass on your belief and or without even having a mentorship relationship with your with your team members, you will likely create the culture of a team that reflects you. And you want to decide is what you are transferring good for the team. Um, and I think that that speaks for itself. And lastly, again, in my experience, self-reflection and self-development, which is what self-leadership is about, always pays off. It always pays off by how your team remains loyal to the vision, remains loyal to the mission that you have put on the table and is more likely to follow what you what you propose than to then go off and decide, you know what, I don't believe in these beliefs. I don't believe in these values. Um, but because you've worked on, on the way that you project um, what is good for the team, more likely than not, you will have a group of people that will want to follow you. Um, and that is, I think, a biggest reward as a leader. So that's on self-leadership. Now let's move to teams and team building. And one thing that I want to say there is when you think about, when you move away from now self to teams, you want to embrace people dynamics. And people dynamics are an interesting thing. They are really literally what follow you and what surrounds you in whatever context you find yourself. You cannot, you cannot run away from people dynamics and dynamics again can be good, can be negative, but you can't run away from them. And so when you are going into team leadership and into team building, you are giving yourself the permission to embrace complexity to embrace the complexities of personalities, of diversity, even, even of a project and how your team responds to a project. And that's what I wanna to touch on now. Here's a quote of Jack Welsh that I, that I quite liked where he says, before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself, right? And this is what we said just now. But when you become a leader, success is all about growing others. And I find it interesting that Jeff Welsh, of all people, would say that because, you know, as some of you might know, he ran a very successful organization that was incredibly results driven. But for somebody like him to say that he would measure success as a leader, as being related to how you have grown others, says a lot about what ultimately matters. Results matter. Um, the growth of an organization matter. Pushing an agenda matters. But what is more important according to this, it's, it's, it's actually the people um, that walk with you or that you walk with um, in this mission that you're pushing for. So when we think about teams or when we think about team building, there are four things that, and there are more, there, there's a lot more in the literature, but I, I wanna pull these four things that I believe you need to be taking into account when you're thinking about team building. You wanna think about your leadership style, right? We're not all the same. We're all leaders, but we each have a different style. Um, and I will say upfront that there's no style that is better than the other. It's more a case of what situation are you in and therefore what style do you, do you need to be adopting in order to drive the best results. So think about the leadership style. There isn't just one, there's a couple that you wanna be adopting depending on where your team finds itself. And you see that, you'll see that some more later. The second thing that I want you to take into account is the diversity of your team. And this is not just the cultural diversity. This is the, this is the response that the team gives to an idea that you have, to a decision that you have, 
uh, and there's diversity in that. Not everybody will respond in the same way. And you want to be open to the fact that there might even be opposition. So how do you deal with that diversity? The third element that I want you to consider is the character of your team. Leading a team in the army is not the same as leading the team in a student committee. It's not the same as leading a team in an NGO. And you want to think about your leadership style depending on where you are, as I said earlier, and understanding the character of your team is crucial for that. And I'll, again, I'll take you through this. And then lastly, uh, a fourth framework I want you to think about is the journey of your team towards performance. And when you think about all of these four elements, you can then tailor what team building will mean in your individual um, contexts. So let's jump right in. In terms of leadership styles, this is one model that I've pulled, which, is, which shows you a continuum about how you communicate to your team, how you convey ideas, and how you really pull um, some level of consensus in the team. So let me tell you, or, or rather let's start at the bottom over here. So let's say there are these five styles of dealing with your team. The first one would be that you tell them what to do. You make the decisions and you announce to them, guys, this is what we're now going to do. You tell them and they do. The next one is you make the decision, sorry. You make the decision, but you explain. You're not just telling people, we're going, this is, I've decided, this is what we're gonna do and we're doing it, but you're taking the time to explain to them why the decision is the right one. Not a lot of consultation there, but still you're making some room for explaining. So this is moving from telling to selling. And then there's the part that is consult. Some of you, particularly in student leadership, might be more aware about this, of this style where you, you make suggestions um, or you let people make suggestions. You yourself, you make suggestions, but then you're the one who decides, right? So that's the consultation phase. And then there's sharing where it becomes a little bit more open-ended about who brings in the suggestions um, and who decides. Perhaps the, the decision at this level is more corporate, but you're the one who defines the limit within which we're going to be making the decision. So for example, you want to organize, let's say this event. Um, you, for argument's sake, the, the, the planning committee decided that they were going to have a virtual meeting and uh, that this was going to be for um, the you know, students of one university. Um, the leadership would have said, we're really focusing on the University of the North Northwest, but maybe people in the committee would have said, oh, but why don't we open this up to maybe either university, right? But so at, at the end, you decide on the decision, well, you decide on an option that makes the most sense, but the leadership of the committee would have said, we're focusing on University of the Northwest. That is an example of defining the boundaries while allowing people to, to exchange and to even corporately make a decision. All the way to delegating. So here as a leader, you have delegated the decision-making, you have delegated the suggestions, but you do that for a reason, right? Um, and just to show you what these graphs mean, you'll see that the authority of the leader or the one who's the designate leader reduces along the spectrum while the authority of the subordinates increase or the freedom, put it that way, of the subordinates increase. Why is this important? Well, if you find yourself leading a team of architects one day or a team of software developers. Everybody's an expert. They know exactly what to do. They don't need to be told what to do, the nitty gritties of their work. All they need to know is, guys, we're building a new app. Now go ahead and build. You're likely here to be delegating the decision-making versus working with, you're an army sergeant and you have new, new recruits. They are not to make any decisions. They are to actually follow your orders. Um, and I hope that by with these two examples, what I'm contrasting here is we're not here to say that an environment where there is a strong authority of, from the leader versus an environment where there's more freedom for the subordinates is better or not. You have to be very aware of the context that you're working in, in order to be able to figure out, okay, which way in this continuum do I need to be putting myself? What, is, what should be my style? 
quite likely if you're dealing with more junior people in terms of experience, you will probably doing more telling and selling. And as you grow as a team and as everybody is a lot more aware of what they need to be doing and what their responsibilities are, you will be good moving more towards the consulting and the sharing. So what's the takeaway from this one is there is not one single style. There's no one single style of communication. There's a continuum that you need to get comfortable moving across from, depending on who you're dealing with, what's the urgency of the project. If you're dealing with an urgent project, let's say you're a firefighter and there's an emergency, there is no time to delegate. You have to get things done right away. More likely than not, you have to tell. Guys, this is what we're going to do now, uh, gentlemen and ladies. Um, so I hope this is making sense. Your leadership style is the first thing that I'd like you to consider when you think about team building. And there are a couple of questions there which I won't go into, otherwise I'll run out of time. Um, the second thing is I spoke about is the individual diversity of the team. So when you come up with an idea, you are, you are likely, this is a study from Deloitte where they said you are likely to get at least five different types of people who will respond to your idea, to your initiative, to your vision. You have the committed who are ready to do whatever it takes to achieve the goal. They welcome the change. Maybe they've been working in a particular setting for a long time. You give them a new idea that changes things, changes the way that they have to work. They're committed to it because they believe in it. The second group of people will be supportive. They are in favor, right? They will be, um, um, they will be a bit ginger, gingerly about whether or not they want to align with the goal that you have set. But you know what? They're supportive. So then when you have the supportive people, you know, okay, these are people maybe that I need to spend a bit more time with to move them to the committed level. There are some that are undecided. They, they, they don't know, okay, the vision sounds great and the initiative, yeah, but it's changing stuff, you know, and, and there are pros and cons to all of this. Why are we just being positive about this new idea that you're putting on the table? And so they undecided about, you know, whether it's such a good idea. Some people are just unaware. Maybe you sent an email, maybe you have put it on a tweet, in a tweet, maybe you think you've communicated it many, many times over, but they still are unaware. And so maybe here what is useful is instead of saying, guys, I sent you an email, you should know. No, take the time to be personal with them and to actually get them to ask questions. Because sometimes even when people have read an email or they've heard you in a meeting come up with an idea, maybe it helps them for them to actually ask you questions, to play it in their own mind so that they move from unaware to supportive and eventually to committed. And very likely, the study, this short study shows that at least 5% of people will be outrightly opposed. We're talking about people who will tell you, I don't like the idea. And guess what you need to do there here? Um, you will want to be building or shaping your communications not doctor the communication, but you have to actually work very hard to show once again why this was important, why this idea was important, why this is going to move the needle for the organization. Um, but your job as a leader is not to just work with the committed. And this is a mistake that we make. We talk to 100 people, only 5% of them are committed, and we take the committed and the supportive and we work with them. Do not forget, your team is also made up of the undecided, the unaware, and the opposed. It's still your team. And your job is not to check them out. Your team is to take this entire group of people, however hard it might be, but take this entire group of people along with you. And there are ways of doing it. Um, for example, you could get some of the committed people to be champions with you, to also spread the word, you know, spread the message. But um, having said all of this, do you want to get to the point where they 100% consensus? No, not really. But what you want is people are at least clear about where this organization is going. You're given enough time for consultation. Now a decision needs to be made and you move. But don't immediately look at people that are undecided, unaware or opposed as the enemy. No, take the time to at least do some consultation there. So team diversity is a level for you to, to bear in mind. And then there's the team character, the team's DNA. And I've alluded a little bit to it. This is a maybe a bit of a complex diagram because there's a lot of explanation behind this. I invite you to have a look at this article, which will explain this a little bit better. But what it says is that there are approximately eight different archetypes of teams. Um, 
this is where in some environments, the leader will need to be a lot more directive versus being a lot more consultative. So take the example of a community organizer and volunteers. You probably work for your Shoko uh, team on campus or you know, you're running a soup kitchen, whatever, these people, and, and you're inviting people to volunteer for the cause. They're all volunteers, they're not being paid for this. They're using a portion of their time to support you. Um, quite likely they're coming in to also share their ideas, share their vision. Um, and so you're more likely than not, your style here is that of, okay, come on guys, let's, let's, let's all work together to make this soup kitchen happen and give everybody a responsibility, right? Everybody needs to be doing something. Everybody feels like they own a little bit of something and, and, and they run it. Um, they don't wait to be told what to do, maybe in some cases, but in a lot of cases, they want to feel like, no man, I, I, I've come to make an impact and I know how I want to make an impact. And so more, most likely than not, you don't want to be stifling their creativity or the way that they want to do it. So you won't be directive in this environment. You will likely create an environment that is a lot more consultative. The opposite of this is a setup. And I gave you the example of, a, of, of the army. There will be some of your work environments where the setup is more general and soldiers you tell they do you give an idea they execute that's just the way it's going to be i give you gave you the example of um, you know working at a fire station it's or, or again in the army there could be other environments like that a factory a factory where you do where you're dealing with heavy machinery that is quite dangerous the supervisor does not have the time to consult you on whether you you agree with the safety policy you must just comply so highly compliance driven environment are likely to be a general and soldier type of environment. Is it bad? No, it's not. It's just necessary for the job that needs to be done. And so you don't wanna be taking your natural consultative style into an environment that requires some diligent um, policies to be applied um, because your soldiers in that environment will go, this leader doesn't know what they want, right? So you want to be very directive. You wanna be clear about what needs to happen there. I gave you the example of a software team, like a software development team, extremely creative, unlikely to need much direction, but they need to be given, they, they need to be given the freedom to just create versus let's say you are the conductor in an orchestra. Yes, there's a lot of creativity and a lot of talent there, but there's a script. You do not go out of the script, right? And I think with these, with these archetypes, really the point that I'm trying to share with you is Wherever you are, again, community leader, cell group leader, whatever you are, think about the DNA. Do you, does your leadership communication or your leadership building or team building require a type of general and soldier setup or does it need a producer and creative team type of setup or, or is it a very democratized environment where everybody has to have a say and you, you, you are not actually um, the one with the most authority? I invite you to have a look at this article and I hope it will shed, shed some light for you as well. And then the last piece is thinking about the journey of your team. And the journey of your team is, uh, some of you might have come across this, um, is, is a typical where either you are new in a, in a team, you have been appointed a leader in a very new team, um, or you have been put together for a very specific purpose. You haven't worked in this particular initiative before. So you need to start forming rules, shaping norms, deciding what is the vision, where do you need to be going? And this is typically called a forming stage. You're all excited about this new thing. You've all come together and it's a bit of a forming stage, a bit of an excitement stage. Then as time goes on and as you understand the reality of the work, um, you're likely to go, in terms of your team energy and your team dynamic, you go, you're likely, more likely than not, uh, going to go into a storming phase where, you know what, these, these initial goals actually did not make sense. And actually, we did not think about how we were going to execute on this. And there's disagreement in the team about how things need to be done. And your role here as a leader is not to just bring people together. Let's just be all happy and you know be like a big family. At this point, you need to go right into the storm and understand the, the reasons for the conflict and be prepared to be outlining once again the vision, outlining what the goals need to be and helping people understand their role and their contribution towards the goal. 
few people or some leaders who will classify themselves as conflict averse will tend to run away, right? The team is storming. Um, I, I don't want to deal with this. Let them, let them figure it out. No, you need to be right there in the storm and also dealing with what's going on. So this is also where you see that your communication at the start of a, con of a meeting, or sorry, at the start of an initiative is likely or needs to be quite different when you, when you run into issues, right? And uh, the next level then, once you, your team has formed and stormed, you will move into what is called a norming phase, where things are beginning to make sense. The processes are beginning to take shape. People understand a little bit better their role and that there's no duplication of effort, that we're not stepping on each other's toes. That's where we're norming. And it's only after we've gone through the forming the storming and the norming stage that we start performing, where we're really beginning to push for results, where we are even exceeding our expectations because we have taken the time to understand that the team goes through phases and gets to the point where we're performing. Too often, unfortunately, as leaders, we come at the start of a team process or a team initiative, we form the team and we shoot straight for results, which is, which is right. But we push and we push for results. Whatever happens in between, whether the processes have been clarified, whether people understand their roles, we skip that. We want people to go straight from norming to performing and that's unrealistic. So you want to allow for time to let the team explore and understand really how they're contributing to that vision. And yes, indeed, that can take time. And, and if you respect the pace, um, it can be a fast pace, but these phases are still important because all of this contribute towards building a stronger team at the end of the day. This is just a quick slide to show you exactly the same thing, the forming, storming, norming stages and where there's a different, there are different communications level. Um, I've alluded to these um, in the earlier slide, but once again, it's about being clear about your objectives at the start of an initiative. When the team is storming, as you can see here, uh, you know, people are fighting over initiative related issues. You need to be there, right in there to resolve conflict and conflicts, resolve them very quickly. Don't delegate the conflict resolution, be in it um, to, the, to, to, to the best of your, as far as possible, be in it, particularly when there are serious issues and remain positive, right? Do not drag the team into, into negativity and into, yes, we're storming guys, let's continue storming, no. Be, be there to show them the way, show them the light and show them the prospect of becoming a performing team. This is another diagram that shows exactly the same thing, but what I like about it is that it's actually not, I want you to focus on the bottom part of it. Forming, storming, norming and performing are the stages, but it's actually not a straight line. In reality, you would love to, especially if some of you are very structured, right? You like thinking in terms of project plans. Yes, your project is probably going to go on an upward trajectory, but your team is likely to be going in a squiggly line all over the place, moving from storming and then to forming again, and then to norming, performing, and then back again to forming. This is what people dynamics is about. Um, and be clear that it's okay. Right. Um, we do not box people. Uh, human human beings are not robots. We have moods. We have um, we we likely to find uh, challenges in terms of our individuals' values and beliefs that will lead us into this, into this, you know, you know toing and froing between storming and norming. And so, as a leader, your call is to be very understanding of that and constantly focus on the bigger picture because your job is to then lead people out of whatever. Uh, quite admire they find themselves in. So to summarize this section, it's 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 really when you're thinking about leadership style, you want to be cognizant of your, sorry, when you're thinking about team building, you want to be cognizant of your leadership style. You want to be aware that your teams don't all respond in the same way. And so you don't want to favor some over others. You want to appreciate the diversity and tailor your communications to address this diversity. You want to think about the character of your team. Are you are you a team that needs very directive processes or a very directive leader? Or are you in a team that needs a lot more freedom, a lot more freedom to create? Um, but ultimately, whether you are in a very open team versus a very close team, the journey to good performance is the same. Every team will go through forming, storming, norming, and then performing, regardless of the shape or the character of the team. And when you take all of these different elements together, you 
will appreciate that it's never just one thing. It continues to be a journey for you to be really an adapted, an adaptable leader um, so that you're able to take your team alongside with you. And now a little bit on communications. Um, and here, I hope that you will have picked up that I have covered a lot while I was talking about teams, while I was talking about yourself or even team building or um, uh, the phases of a team, it's really all about communication at the end of the day and how you tailor your communications one-on-one, -on -one, one to a group or one to the organization. And what I'm saying here is that communication is essentially the currency for team building. You can, some people will get to a point in your career where you want to outsource this team building to a service provider who will run a team building workshop. Team building is ongoing and you need to be in the middle of it and you don't do that if you do not communicate and do, learn to communicate effectively. I will not go into what communication is and the different forms of communication. Again, there's a lot of material out there, but I want to pull some nuggets of wisdom that I read in an article a couple of days ago. Um, which I've referenced here that you can go to as well. Uh, this is an article that was written by Adil uh, Kayum, and he outlines, I would say, perhaps the 10 commandments of leadership communications. Number one, do not make false promises. Um, you can attempt to make demands that you want people to trust you, but it rarely works uh, if you're going to make false promises um, because eventually you will be found out. Um, and if you are building a team for, for the long run, you want to be as honest, as authentic, and as real right at the start, even if it doesn't please some people, so that, yeah, when you get to a month, a year, 10 years down the line, yeah, people know that you were, you were being genuine. So don't make false promises. It doesn't help. It helps initially, especially if you're used to running elections. Um, it, ha it helps for that, but it doesn't help in the longer run. So what kind of team are you building? Uh, and if you're building a team for the long haul, false promises do not help you. Be personal. It's easy for us to use our position to stay at a certain level and to be talking top down all the time because it's more comfortable that way. But again, if you want to uh, foster an environment that builds loyalty, that builds uh, goodwill, you want to be personal. You want to care about the people that are around you. And I like this quote that says that people don't care how much you know when you're communicating, they will actually know how much you care. Uh, no, sorry, people don't know how much you, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so that personal touch is quite important in your leadership. Be very specific, don't be vague. If you're communicating a vision, if you're community go, uh, communicating goals, paint a picture that is real, um, People want to identify with something that is tangible for them to go to. Not necessarily materially tangible, but something tangible. If, if you say to people, you need to work harder, it might help to say, you know, our goal is to reach a thousand people through this mission. And I really need you to make a personal goal of you, of yourself, to reach 50 in the next two months. Do you think you can do that? You see the difference? between saying you need to work harder, you're not reaching enough people and going back to the vision and making it personal and say, I want you to reach 50 out of the thousand. You make it very specific. You don't give them the thousand, like they need to reach the thousand people. You give them the 50 and then they know, oh, okay, this is my goal. So be very specific in your communication. Transfer vision and not just information. The example that I've given you earlier was about that. Have an open mind. We, we touched on this when I, I was talking about storming. And this individual says, the writer of this article said that unfortunately, too many people are fearful of opposing views. And so when we have somebody who comes at us with an opposing view, we'll tend to either shut it down, ignore it because ugh, they don't get it. You know, they don't get how big this vision is. And so let's just ignore them. No, go in there and actually hear, hear them out. Hear why they are opposed. Is it fear? Is it risk? Or is it that they have more experience than you do and they could teach you one or two things? The decision doesn't have to change, but you need to hear the opposing view because there's a huge amount that you can learn um, when you keep an open mind and are open to different perspectives. So have an open mind is number five. Number six is keep quiet and listen. 
uh, and I've come across a lot of, and, and I fall into that trap myself because I feel that I know a bit more in a meeting and I'm very clear about the decision that we need to make and end up being the one who talks the most. Mistake. Uh, take the time to be quiet and to listen, which again relates to point number five. Um, because then you're able to know how you can truly engage in meaningful conversations because you have listened rather than spoken more in a meeting. Number seven, replace your ego with empathy. I think that speaks for itself. Number eight, be good at reading between the lines. Um, and I will agree with the statement that great leaders are very adept at reading between the lines. Uh, we may be talking about the future, we may be talking about you know, purpose and, and all sorts of things. Some people can put into a conversation, sometimes a, a very heavy conversation, their own feelings, their own, their own beliefs, their, their, their own agenda. Read between the lines. What are people really trying to say? And let, don't assume that they are ill-intentioned, but try to read between the lines. And sometimes a good leader who listens well also understands that it's not the words that you hear because uh, not everybody is good at expressing what they want to con or conveying what they want to say. Um, so reading between the lines is a great skill where you're able to say to somebody, you know what, you've said this, but do you mean this? And when you're able to do that, um, it just opens up just such great avenues for exchange between yourself and your team. And so le learn to, to read a room and to read between the lines rather than just the words um, when you're in conversation with your team. Uh, number nine, uh, be clear what you're talking about. Uh, this is this may be in some cases will probably be number one. When you're stepping into a leadership position, I think particularly if you're move, going into a technical environment, it helps a huge deal that you know a little bit more than your subordinates. Um, if you're the chief architect, well, if you're an architect, you wanna and you're the chief architect. Hopefully, you've got a few years more experience than them in order to be able to show the way. If you're not an architect yourself and you're a medical doctor working with a team of architects and you're planning a building, just imagine the and and, and decide for yourself whether you'll have credibility in that team. So credibility is a, means a lot when you're a team leader. Um, you will not know everything. Some, some team members may know some things more than you, but know your subject. Don't go into a discussion, not having at least done enough of your, of your research to be able to show why you're making certain decisions or why you want um, a certain initiative to, to go in a certain way. So know what you're talking about because you will be found out and your team will actually not find you credible. And then lastly, Speak to groups as individuals. And this is the same thing as, as being more personable rather than being uh, uh, adopting of a top-down communication style all the time. Um, I think I've run out of time, and, but this is essentially what I wanted to cover with you from a team building and a communications aspect. Um, and what I want to leave with you is really this. Um, it's not linear building a team or communicating with a team is not linear. It's a whole bunch of stuff. You will know that you have several responsibilities, be it that you are the vision bearer, that you need to be the communicator, that you have people that you're leading and all sorts of things. And it's not linear. It's not things that you can put in different boxes and deal with them when you get there. You're actually, and this is what this, the, I like this picture because it shows you that it's there all the time. It's decision-making all the time. It's knowledge all the time. It's people all the time. Um, and, and it's not always easy. In fact, you, you will do yourself a disservice to prioritize vision over people or people over communication or communication over knowledge. You need to be an all-rounded individual in order to bear the type of credibility that helps you to lead a team um, that will eventually follow you in your venture. And I'll end with this quote. Become the kind of leader that people would follow voluntarily, even if you had no title or position. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Is there any question? Um, thank you, Ms. Maria. That was a, thought, a very thought-provoking presentation and I didn't even know that leadership had a wide and uh, flexible spectrum. 
but I have only one question for my side. You mentioned that in terms of team, in raising people dynamics, one should establish or know their leadership skills. How would you describe your leadership skills? Style? Uh, initially, I would have said to you that um, I'm a reluctant leader and that, uh, and, and next to that, that I tend to be very consultative that I like hearing from people before we make a decision. And I've had to change that. Uh, so my personal journey has led me to being a person who's first of all okay with being the one with whom the buck stops. And because the buck stops with me, I've become very comfortable with having to make decisions sometimes, um, even outside of having the time to have enough con consultation. And so I move from being very consultative to remaining consultative when I can, but understanding when there's an emergency or when there's no time, I need to be a lot more decisive. And so I think that I'm on a spectrum of consulting and just quick decision-making while at the same time, always, always being transparent to the team so that they know whether I've made a decision slightly before you, you know why I made a decision and nothing has to be a surprise. Um, so I guess what I'm saying, Ms. Eddie, is there isn't a single name that I want to give to my leadership style per se. What I want to say is that I've adopted the continuum and that I've learned to practice moving along that continuum of, of a leadership style. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll just jump right to the Q&A sessions. I have a question from Huawei P20 Light Motato. Just asking which of the styles are ideal for organizations such as NPOs? Say that again. Sorry, let me get that good. Which of the styles are ideal for organizations such as NPOs? I'm guessing uh, leadership mm, styles. Mm, mm, sure, sure. No, no, no. So, so I wouldn't, uh, what, what I don't want us to do is to say these types of organizations and this type of leadership style. You'll be surprised that in some for example, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, is an NGO. They work in emergency situations all the time. You may have heard that you know a volcano erupted in Eastern DRC. I promise you, uh, if Médecins Sans Frontières is there, we're not talking about a consultative style right now. We're dealing with, we need to save, we need to help people, we need to move them out of there, and that's just what we need to do, right? So it's not the type of organization. That, that really matters as such. Um, although in some, in some cases it's easier, right? So we know that in the army, being directive is mostly you know, what matters. But even within the army, if you are amongst officers, right? People that are in your rank, are you going to be, they're the same rank as you, are you going to be directive towards them? Not likely, you're going to be more consultative. So what's important here is you as a leader in a team understand what is necessary. What's your environment telling you should be the style, right? Of your team and engage in that type of style. Learn how to be more directive if you're not. Learn to be more consultative in your, if you're not. So it's more situation-based than it is organization-based. I have a question, oh. Lucidi, if I may. Sure, Thank you, ahead. Maya. I loved your presentation. I wanted to ask uh, two questions. Would you agree that adversity breeds unlikely leaders, that leaders are sometimes born out of crisis? Yes, <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. Um, because, and and, and my, my reflection on this is, if not me, then who? Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you see the need around you, and if there's something that kicks in inside of you that says, um, unless I do even my little bit, uh, this is going to be more of a disaster than it already is, and I have to step into it. Um, absolutely, yes. Um, and Thank this, you. this, this is probably the. It's a short answer to really a big question. Yeah. Thank you very much. And then my my second question is: Is it likely that those that oppose us develop us into better leaders? Do they develop our problem skills? I think they do a couple of things. Um, I think they, they put, yes, skills in the sense that you'll learn to, uh, to face opposition. 
and you learn to step up out of your comfort zone where you're just used to consensus. So you definitely become a much better diplomat when you're dealing with oppositions. Um, in the moment, it's not easy to welcome the opposition because some of it can be quite toxic, but you learn and you learn not by running away from it or not by pointing fingers and by uh, uh, demonizing the opposants, but rather by saying, perhaps you get to a point where you agree to disagree. Um, I want to, I think, I think we know that op opposition can also to be quite toxic and so we want to, I want to take all of this with a pinch of salt and say there's some of it that you shouldn't embrace. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't embrace uh, an attack on your character or on your personality. Um, and maybe the, the skill there is actually learning to push back and say, you know, no, I don't believe that this, uh, this represents me and I don't want to be spoken to like that, right? And so you grow perhaps, and it's not the intention of the opposer to grow you that way, but you grow but by learning to push back and also by, by teaching yourself lessons where you can learn to be more diplomatic. Thank you very much, Maya. I loved it. Over to you, Lissedi and Ibril. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ababed. Um, I also have a question here. Uh, I have read somewhere that 93% of communication is transmitted through physiology and uh, a tone of voice, and only 7% through words alone. As a result, you need to send a verbal and nonverbal messages as a leader. Concurrently, what's your take on that? I don't know if it's 98%. Because, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I know, I know what. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's that much, um, and, but I don't want to dispute the, the study that was done. Um, maybe that's also why they say, don't use too many words and be succinct, be clear, because actually when you talk too much, people lose you or you lose the people, you lose people around you. I agree big time that your body language, the tone of your voice say a lot. Uh, about whether you are in control and whether you are handling the situation. If you're going to talk, if you're in a panic room, and I'm trying to, you know, just think of, of emergency situations that, that affected, let's say, government and leaders. And just imagine their, their war room or their panic room. <laughs> Let me call it the panic room. Just imagine them screaming and yelling at each other versus actually just being calm, taking the facts one after the next and actually being able to show that, all right, I'm going to internalize this information and make a decision on that basis. It communicates a huge amount of trust when you can manage how your body language confirms your words. But if your body language shows that you, shows, for example, fear, it's going to be a very different story, right? So I, I totally agree um, with that because uh, what we, what, well, I guess what we're imparting is because we're dealing with people's mindsets also and with, with their hearts and with how they need to feel about the environment, a big amount of that environment is set by us as leaders. The tone is set by the way that we present ourselves. And uh, so working on our nonverbal communication, I agree, is, is key. But it starts with feedback. It starts with receiving feedback on, on whether the way that you're communicating non-verbally or verbally works for the team because how else will you guess, right? It doesn't start with the, uh, the uh, textbook, it starts with feedback and then you work on how you improve it. Oh, okay, thank you. So we have, okay. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Maya. Sure. It has been such a pleasure to have you here. I hope to see you again. I'll see you again. It was a pleasure to be a part of this. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.